is Michael, and I'll be reading today's, um, today's text. And it comes from Ephesians 6, verse 1 to 4. So it says that the title of the message is Children and Parents. Um, so it says, Children, obey your parents um, in the Lord, because this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you, and that you may have a long life in the land. Fathers, don't stay, stay up in anger in your, in your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. This is the reading of God's word. Thank you. Praise be to God. We're going to talk about parenting today. Don't check out, listen, if you are not a parent at the moment, because we are going to talk about your parents as well. Okay? Stay with me. Currently in a series called Real Talk. purpose of Real Talk is to talk open, honestly, and candidly about tough subjects. Why? Because we felt like we needed it in our church in this specific time. We started the series with a very strong exhortation telling you not to waste your life. Why? Because some of us are wasting our lives. After that, we spoke about sex, we spoke about marriage, and today we're going to talk about parenting. And over the last three weeks, we kept on reminding you that these topics all belong together like different parts of uh, a plate of food. Okay, so sex, marriage, and parenting go together. It's like one meal. It just exists of different parts. Now, parenting isn't a simple topic, let's be honest. It's actually quite complex because you are holding multiple things together at once when we talk about parenting. Fam, I know that this is not a happy topic for many of you. And I just want to say that. I know that the moment I mention parents, mothers, fathers, and the task of parenting that some of you might feel really anxious and that some of you might even be scared about what I'm about to say and also about what you're about to experience. Fam, this world is so broken that some of you listening to me now might even have been abused by parents. So when I say parenting, I know it's not happy for all of us. I also know, and Leon alluded to it now, that we have a massive diversity of family backgrounds in this place. And we have a massive diversity of cultures in this place. I see you. And as your pastor, I know you. And not only do I know you, I care for you and I love you. And I prayed for you and about you this whole week. As I was prepping through the week, I felt this heaviness come over me for our people. Because I know what you're going through. Like, I know what your lives are made up of. I also know what many of you have been through. So I reached out to Sunaba, the leader of our prayer ministry, and I'm like, sis, get the prayer ministry to start praying into this. Like, we need to get gnarly on this topic. So please, pray for our people, pray for me, pray for the sermon, pray for this Sunday. This space, at least for the next how many minutes, is safe. We are family. This is a family matter. And we need to have real talk about this. Okay. Let's stir our imaginations and our hearts a little bit. Let's get the juices flowing. If you feel like you need to close your eyes for this, you can. Otherwise, you don't have to. Let whatever comes to mind come to mind. Allow yourself to feel what you feel. Let's go on an imaginary journey. Think of your own parents. Think of your parents in law if you have them or even if you had them. Think of your siblings. They also fit into this picture. Own parents, parents in law, siblings. Think of your own children, if you have them, or even if you had them. Think of your spouse. 
or the other parent or parents of your children if you are not together anymore. Let's acknowledge the fact that all of these thoughts and emotions that we just felt are present and they are influential the moment we talk about this topic. It's heavy, fam. It's heavy. If you close your eyes, you can open it now. Can you see that this sermon is not only for people who are currently parents? It is relevant to everyone who's ever been a child. And that means it's relevant to all of us. So we're going to tackle all of these complexities this morning by doing a really deep study of the teaching text. Because the teaching text has some phenomenal imp implications and applications for us. And we're going to do this by answering three questions. Okay, so I made it really easy. It's very complex, but I made it easy. Here you go. Who should obey who and why? First one. Second one. Who should honor who and why? Third one. Who should do what to who and why? I want to warn you before I start that this is not going to be an easy message. So will you please posture yourself for a not easy message? Question of the day was meant to bring some of these thoughts and emotions to the surface. And as you heard from the feedback now, it did that already. Before we pray, I want to ask you a question if you are a parent today. Here's your question. What do you want for your child? Listen closely. Not what do you want from your child. What do you want for your child? I'm going to tuck that one away and we'll get back to it later. Let's pray. Father God, here we are. Your children part of your family, saved by your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, knowing you as our King and our Lord and our brother in this beautiful family, guided and indwelled by the Holy Spirit, depending on the promise that you made, Lord Jesus, that the Holy Spirit will illuminate and teach us everything that you've taught us. So here we are, ready to hear from you as we open up your word this morning. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would illuminate us, Lord Jesus, that you would humble us, that we would be willing to submit under your word, that we would be er edified, encouraged, inspired, exhorted, admonished through this word. We want to live compelling lives of love towards other people, Lord Jesus, and we want to do it for your glory's sake. So guide my words, guide our thoughts. I pray that in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Okay, so before we jump into the three points, let's just back up and let's just get some context, right? Because our teaching text is in a letter written by a person to other people. It's called Ephesians. It's the book's name. There's a map of Ephesians for you. And what's really important to see is Ephesians can be divided into two parts, chapter 1 to 3 and chapter 4 to 6. And it's all linked by the word therefore. So Paul explains the gospel message more than once in the first half of the letter. And then he says, therefore, this is the implications of everything that I've just said to you. And Paul is busy talking about how they should live, therefore. So all of this happened, and therefore, you should now live in a distinct, different, Christ-like, loving, spirit-filled way. Let me make it practical. Okay? Let me show you some links in the book. Here are some scriptures uh, through the course of Ephesians. First one in chapter 4, he says, Therefore I say this and testify in the Lord, you should no longer walk as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thoughts. There should be a change. Chapter 5, Therefore be imitators of God as dearly loved children and walk in love. This is what I'm expecting of you. As Christ also loved us and gave himself for us. A sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. A few verses later. Pay careful attention then to how you walk. Not as unwise people but as wise. Making the most of the time because the days are evil. 
Paul says, let me make it practical, all of these therefores, and let me talk about your everyday relationships. Let me talk about what's going on in your house and all the relationships in the house. Look at this amplified picture of that own map. Paul is talking about the Christian household. And he starts with husband and wife. Last week, Lesego preached an absolute ripper on the topic. You have to go and listen to it. Go, go do it. And now he talks about the other relationships also existing in a house. Why? Because how we live matters. What we do matters. Who we are matters. Real talk, fam. Thanks, mate. If you desire to live a compelling life of love towards others, a life that glorifies God and honors all the relationships He's given to you, then you will take this very seriously. I want to ask you a question. Is that what you desire? Or are you desiring something less and mediocre? It's an honest question, fam, that needs an honest answer. Okay, let's look at the first one. Who should obey who and why? I made you some highlights. I kept it really short. Go with me here. Who? That word children is non-adults. In our case, kids below the age of 18. In that time, kids below, kids below the age of 12. These are kids old enough to understand what it means to have a relationship with Jesus but young enough to be completely dependent on parents. Do you guys see that? So all of our kids fit into this category. Our threes to nines fits into this category because they are starting to understand what relationships is, are. And then our tens and ups fit into this category perfectly. And Paul says to these children, here's what you need to do. Listen up, kids, if you are in the hall at the moment. Hear what your parents says. Listen to it and do it. That's it. So Paul addresses this group of people in the church by name as non-adults, giving them a command, saying that they should obey their parents. Why? Look at the last part of the verse. Because this is right. <laughs> Here's what Paul says. This will keep relationships right with one another. It will keep things ordered. It will create a space for everyone in the family to live and to flourish. You need to think of everyone in the house, not only of yourself. That is why you should obey your parents. You think it's only about you and the parent that you don't want to obey. But you are making it messy for everyone. And you're taking life and flourishing away from everyone. And that's why Paul says, if you obey your parents, then this is right. And all the relationships will be kept and ordered. I know it's a hard one if you are 13 and you think you're more clever than your parents. You're not. You need to listen to them. And parents, this is also the exhortation that we give to our kids. is The reason why I want you to listen to me is because it is what the Bible expects of you, and it will make it better for everyone in the house. Now what about that little line in the middle? In the Lord. What does that mean? Does anyone want to have a go? It's quite complex, right? Here's what Paul says. Check. He says, Kids, don't only obey your parents because they have a superior authority to you. Not only because um, they have a superior status, but... It's part of your Christian discipleship to actually obey your parents. Because when you obey them, then you do what you also should do to the Lord. That's what he says. Isn't that just phenomenal? So children's relationship to their parents present children with a space or a sphere in which to carry out obedience to their Lord. So you teach your kids... When you are obedient to us, you are obedient to the Lord. The way that you learn how to be obedient to the Lord is by being obedient to us. Right? One day I want you to hear the Lord and then to be able to obey. How are you going to practice that? Well, you practice that by hearing what I say to you and then obeying it. Do you guys see it? And that's why Paul says you obey your parents in the Lord. 
Can you see, parents, the massive responsibility we have to expect the right things from our children and not to boss them or order them around? Can you see how telling your kids to do stuff for you is not the right thing? Just because you're lazy and then you shout at your kids to do stuff for you and then forcing them to be obedient to you because the Bible says it, you are doing the wrong thing. We are not meant to boss our kids around. We are meant to tell them what to do. I'll give you a frame for that in just a little bit. We need to be clear about what we're expecting of them because we need to teach them that when they listen to us, they are learning how to be obedient to the Lord Himself. We have a massive responsibility. Your kids are not your slaves. Can you also see how this verse is not for adults? This verse says children, meaning non-adults. So if you are an adult here today, you are not commanded to obey your parents. Can you see that? You're commanded to do something else. And what is that? Well, let's look at the next point. Here's what you're commanded to do. You are commanded to honor your father and mother. That's what you commanded to do. Okay, so who is this for? This is for everyone. Why? Because it's a commandment. And the Ten Commandments, it's only ten, and it counts for everyone. Because that's a way in which society will flourish. So everyone, regardless of your age, this counts for you. Okay, what should you do? You should honor. What does that mean? We'll get back to it now. Who should you honor? Your parents, father and mother. Why? Look at it. So that, and that, and it's the first commandment with a promise. So you do it because it's commanded of you, period. And you also do it so that and that. Because there's a promise connected to it. And that promise is that it may go well and that you may have a long life. We'll get back to this now. Real talk. Your parents hit the goal with some things. That's true. Your parents got some things right. Absolutely. And we praise God for it. Your parents also missed the mark on other things. Your parents got it wrong. Being an adult means courageously reflecting on your parents and being willing and able to acknowledge where they nailed it and being willing and able to acknowledge where they missed it. Fam, that's part of being an adult. No parent in this world is perfect. As I am a parent now, I am failing, fam. I'm missing the mark. I'm also nailing it. It's both the whole time. But when you become an adult, you have to courageously reflect on where your parents nailed it and where they missed it. And then it's about being willing to duplicate the good and further their legacy and also to stop the wrong of their parenting and not repeat it in your own parenting. Do you guys see it? If God gifts you the opportunity to be a parent. While you do this, you honor them. While you do this, you honor them. Acknowledging where your parents failed doesn't give you an opportunity for dishonoring them. Unfortunately not. Because I know it brings up stuff in us. And we feel resentment and anger and exasperation. You still honor your parents. That's what the Bible says. Okay, now let's look at verse 2 and 3 again. It should still be up on the screen. Fam, <laughs> I had to read a ton of commentary this week to really get a grip on everything that is implied here. This is a thick portion of Scripture. This is the best 
possible, shortest, most concise explanation I can give you. And I'm going to read it. So don't check out just because I read. I'm quoting. I'll even start with, start quoting, end quote. Here it is. Start quote. It was understood, this is now honoring, as involving not only a respectful attitude towards your parents, but also care for the parents' physical needs when they become old. That's what honoring meant in this verse. So, for children still in the father's house, it would mean obedience to the parents. I've already covered that. And for those who had left home, it would mean continued deference to and care for aging parents. Respectful attitude, continued deference, care. In the passage itself, still quoting, the rewards of well-being and long life are held out to individual children who honor their parents. End quote. That's what's going on here. When Paul quotes this, that is what he means. Okay, now, go well. Why would it go well with you if you honor your parents? Fam, have you seen how heavy it is to carry broken parent-child relationships? Have you seen it? Have you experienced it? It can be crushing. Ask anyone who's estranged from their parents. Ask anyone who has a destructive or toxic relationship with their parents. It's hard. It's very hard. It is possible that it can go well with you, listen, in spite of these broken relationships. That is true. But you still carry them. And they're not going away. Even if your parents died. Strained relationships never leave you. You carry it until the day you die. That's why Paul says, when we honor our parents, and we don't carry a broken parent-child relationship, and we're not estranged, and it's not a toxic relationship, it will go well with us. Because the burden is off. The word parenting, or a reminder of a birthday, or a reminder of a space, or a place, or a story, doesn't bring up all the hurt. But I also need you to hear from me that it can go well with you even in the midst of these relationships, especially if they are broken beyond reconciliation. That's a conversation for a different space. Have a long life. Like, what does that mean? Does that mean you're going to grow old? Is that what Paul says? Does Paul say, honor your father and mother and plan your 90th birthday because then you're definitely going to get old? No. Check. If you honor your parents, you show respect towards them, you defer to them, you serve them, you care for them, then there's something for you to do while they are here and while they are still alive. True? Right? So it's something active. Something that you need to do. Something that will ask something of you. Something that requires action. And then there's something for them to leave when they die. And I'm not only talking about inheritance and your parents' stuff, I'm talking about their legacy, right? So if you are in the right relationship with your parents, an honoring relationship, they continue to be with us through that which they invested in us and taught us, that which they left with us. And that will help us forward. That will help us progress in life. That will help us to have a long life. Do you guys see it? So, not only is it keeping busy with your parents while they are here, it's also receiving from them what they can leave with you even after they passed, and then those things helping you. Something like my mom's servant heart, my mom's willingness to sacrifice, my mom's willingness to put herself second. That'll stay with me until the day I die. She's still alive now, but even if she would die, that will help me forward. Do you guys see it? My dad's generosity, my dad is very generous. And from a small age, I saw an open hand and not a closed hand. I thought it was commonplace that people could just always borrow your stuff. Later, I learned it's just because my dad is a really generous guy. He's still alive today, still generous today. But once he dies, I will remain generous. 
and it'll help me move forward in the life that I have. Do you guys see how this promise works? If you have broken and strained relationships in this life, we carry a heavy burden while they are here, and we miss out on what they had when they are gone, because we could never receive it. And then they leave nothing to help you forward. Are you guys following me? This is something really important for us to understand. And that's why Paul says, the logical response for you to your parents is show a respectful attitude and care for them. That is what is asked of you if you are not a non-adult anymore. Real talk. I know this is very hard for some of us. I know. I also know that this is not as straightforward as we might wish it is. But fam, it is a promise that is held out to us. And that's a decision that we have to make. Do we want the promise? Because if we want the promise, we have to do what the commandment says. And that promise is the rewards of well-being and long life. And that's held out to individual children who honor their parents. Everything I just said is ours to sit with. It's ours to wrestle with. Mike, I'm so glad that you shared what you did in question of the day. Because, mate, I'm not helping you now, but I'm just acknowledging the wrestle. <laughs> because we have to wrestle through this. So whatever just came up in you, tie it down and wrestle with it and sit with it. Because it can be hard and it's not as straightforward, but it does hold the promise. Who should do what to who and why? Third point. How are you guys doing? Doing all right? A blessed book always goes like this. So just give me a blessed book. We're doing all right. Okay. Who should do what to who and why? Verse 4. Fathers. That's the who. And there's a reason why Paul only says fathers. He means fathers and mothers, but there's a reason why he only says fathers. I'll get there now. Don't. Do you see the don't? It's a negative command. Don't stir up anger. I'm going to get there now. Do, positive command, bring them up. Okay, who? Your children, that's what it says. And how? In training and instruction. You guys with me? Why does Paul say fathers? Two things. Firstly, the father in Paul's time was the representative of the family. The face. The head, the name carrier, the honorable spokesperson. So in Paul's time, speak to the father and the rest of the family will follow. That's how it worked. So, it does include mothers, but Paul doesn't have to say that because it's being assumed. Are you feeling me? It's like if Paul talks to me. And Paul tells me this, then I turn around to my wife and I go, do you know what Paul told me? He told me we should do this, 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 and this. So you and I are in this together, let's go. That's how it works. So it implies mothers, but Paul only speaks to fathers because of the face and the head and the representative of the family, and also because a father's words weigh a ton. Fam, listen to me. A father's words can make or break a child. That is how God designed the family. Listen, I'm not saying a mom's words don't matter. I'm saying a father's words weigh a ton. I know not everyone has or had a dad. I understand that. By God's grace, he raises up champion moms in those circumstances, to pull the kids through. And we praise Him for it. But what I want you to hear today, is if you are a dad now, you really need to listen up. 
Your words can make or break your kids. I cannot explain it. It's how it is. So moms and dads, with this heavy responsibility in mind, what should we do then with our words? Look at the first one with me. Don't stir up anger. Another English word that you might have heard is the word exasperate. Don't exasperate your children. Do you know how we do this? We do this by being inconsistent with our kids. Which leads them to not knowing what they can expect of you. Because on the one hand, you react like this, and then the next day, you react totally inconsistent like this. How on earth should a kid know what to expect from you? Simple illustration. Today, you're watching sports. There's a lot of sports to watch for the sports fans. Or you're watching some telly. Lots of series to watch for telly fans. And the kids do something that's wrong. And today you just let it slide. Because you're busy with something. And then tomorrow they do exactly the same wrong thing. And you come down on them like a ton of bricks. Because now you feel like disciplining them. Because you're not distracted with something else. That is inconsistent. You need to be consistent. When you do this. When you act inconsistently, you stir up anger in your kids because they don't know how to relate to you, so they start hating you. That's what happens in the parent-child relationship. You are making it difficult for me to know how to relate to you, mom and dad, so I'm starting to feel resentment and anger towards you. Because the one day it's all good, the next day it's all wrong. How should I know? That's how we stir up anger in our kids. Do you know we also stir up anger in our kids? We expect the impossible from them. Fam, expecting your kids to think and act and reason and repent like you is wrong. Because they can't. Because they're kids. They are not adults. You cannot expect a three-year-old child to think like a 33-year-old adult. It's impossible. And when you do, you exasperate them and you stir up anger in them because you're asking something of them that they simply cannot do. How would you feel if I come down on you like a ton of brick asking you to do something that I full well know you can't do? I would get angry. If Harry asks me to pick up that guitar now and to play it and I tell him I can't and he goes, no, you can, you can, you can, you can, you know exactly how to do it. I'm going to start to get angry because I don't. I don't even know how to hold the thing, man. Because I'm not a guitar player. Your kids aren't adults, they're kids. When Marie and I are in a discipline situation with our kids, do you know what we say to each other? We say, someone needs to be the adult here now. And it can only be us. We can't expect of our kids to reason like us. Our kids don't have the same established values like us yet. Right? We're training them in it. But they can't get it right every single time. We can't even get it right every single time. Fam, who of you as a parent can say, I nail it the whole day, every day? None of you can. It's impossible. So, we need to have grace with our kids. Again, and again, and again. Doesn't that sound like the way God relates to us? Yeah? When you expect your kids to be perfect, they will feel backed into a corner every time they sin, and their only response is anger and lashing out back at you. Okay, I think we need a breather here. Because some of you might be triggered in a big way now. Just the whole thing I said about fathers might have done it in you. The whole thing that I might have said about stirring up anger in your kids, you might have felt that you were stirred up in anger when you were a child in the way that your parents parented you. Fam, breathe. I've got good news for you. Listen, listen. We have a Father in heaven who is perfect. 
We have a Father in heaven who can be known. <laughs> Our Father in heaven came into the world through Jesus to be known, to show Himself to us. And if you believe in Him, He dwells inside of you through the Holy Spirit. This perfect heavenly Father isn't in some far-off place. He is as close to you, inside of you, as your next breath. Can you see why Jesus died for us? Jesus died for us so that this relationship with this perfect heavenly Father could be restored. So that we could be reconciled to our Father. So that we can be healed of all the hurts that earthly fathers and earthly relationships caused us. That's why Jesus came to die. It's good news. And if we experience the Father's love, fam... It changes everything for us. Not only are we restored, but we are loved. We are kept safe. We are given a relationship in which we can fully become who God created us to be. And not only that, we, when we experience the Father's love, we can become a channel through which this love can flow to others. And it can flow back to our parents who hurt us. And it can flow to our kids who God has now given us so that we don't hurt them in the same way. That's a lot of grace, fam. Do you see it? I don't know about you, but I want to lose my mind. Because luckily God fixed this. And it doesn't have to be broken and hurtful until the day we die. And we have the ability when we are reconciled with our perfect heavenly Father to actually love flawed and evil and toxic earthly parents back and return love to them. And we can share that love with the kids that's been given to us. Do you know our perfect heavenly Father? You know that you need to admit your sin, believe in Christ, and confess Him as Lord and Savior. And you're in. You're in His family. Then you can receive His love for you. He showed it to you on the cross. He was willing to give up His own Son for you, and you aren't even one of His own. You have to be adopted into His family. Fam, when Marie and I miss the mark with our kids, which we do, do you know what we do? We share the gospel with our kids, and then we share how the gospel is good news to us. In that moment, I, Reino, sit with my kids and I say to them, my heavenly father would never do that to me. Never. So what I did to you, my heavenly father will never do to me. Therefore, I should never have done it to you. I missed the mark. I'm sorry. Will you please forgive me and allow me another chance. Because the gospel gives us a lot of chances. Always. That's how I repent to my kids when I miss the mark. It should be saturated in the gospel. Don't stir up anger in your kids. Okay, let's go positive. What should we do with them? We should bring them up. We should nurture them. We should give to them. We should create a space and an environment in which they can grow, fam. That's what you ought to do with your kids. Think of gardening as a good metaphor. So from the simple things like the house you actually live in, to more complex things like spending time with them in conversation, not only barking orders at them, but listening to what they say back to you, Replying to that, learning something together, laughing with your children, all of that is creating a space and an environment in which your kids can grow. So a simple application would be, just think of the sentence I just read, the house you live in, conversation, listening, learning, laughing, and think of your own relationship with your kids. What can be changed to be better? Because I promise you, there are some quick wins here. 
Simple things like sitting around a table when you eat. Kids who sit around a table around dinner time three times a week have a better chance of being successful in life. Kids who commit suicide are not kids who were taught the wrong things. They were kids who were taught nothing. Because their parents never taught them anything. So they don't know what to do. And then they become angry and resentful and then they kill themselves. Sit your kids around the table. Look them in the eye. And I know you're going to beg them a thousand times to eat their food. It's part of the burden, fam. Just do it. <laughs> but look them in the eye. Listen. Ask questions to your children. Listen to their answers. Tell them stories. Switch off the television. Switch off the devices that so easily distract us and entangle us. Bring them up. How? Training and instruction. Two really fascinating words. They have the same and different meanings. It's quite cool. We call it nuanced meanings. Okay? So let's look at training. Bring them up in the training. Okay, so I'm a runner. Think of a running program. I want to run a certain time on the Comrades Marathon next year, and someone gives me a training program. What does this training program tell me? It tells me, this is what you ought to do. Go and do it. That's training. Okay? So discipline is the key word here. The training program has got clear guidelines, tells me exactly what I should do, and now I should have the discipline to do it. Discipline means stay in your lane. Discipline means follow the rules. Why? Because it's for your own good, because if you follow this discipline, you'll achieve the goal that you want to achieve. Do you see it? Okay, so that's part of the one thing that we should give to our kids. We should tell them what they ought to do. And then we should tell them that they should go and do it. And then we should remind them that we need discipline from them to keep on doing what we told them to do. We need to help them when they stray from their lane to get back in line. We need to tell them when they break the rules that there are rules which they shouldn't break. Do you see it? That's what you do. So you bring them up in that discipline. Okay, 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 okay. Is it only that? Is it only telling your kids what they ought to do? No. Because the second word tells us, how? Instruction. Do you see it? And I'll get to of the Lord now. So instruction is that moment when you tell your kid to do something and they answer you with, yes, but how? That is when you show your kids how. Do you see it? That's when you teach your kids step by step. That is when you explain to your kids how and why and what they ought to do. That is when you give feedback to your kids about how they are doing. That is when you praise your kids when they get it right. That is when you rebuke your kids when they get it wrong. That is when you ask of your kids if anything is unclear in terms of the order that you gave. That's instruction. So I just used a running program as an illustration. A good illustration here would be a running program and a coach that actually helps me through this running program. Because if I only have the program, I might be frustrated. I might be discouraged because I see all these rules, but I don't know why. Like explain to me why I have to run hilly runs. Explain to me what a hilly run is. Explain to me the pace that I have to do my laps on. Explain to me how long a short hill is. Explain to me what gradient it is. Tell me why I should run fast there and slow there. Tell me why it's wrong when I run too fast or too slow. Ah, oh, now I get it. Okay, cool. So I feel empowered because there was instruction coming with the training. Do you guys see it? It's exactly the same in the bringing up of your kids. Training, rules, and instruction. Explaining, guiding, modeling. Okay. <clears throat> Ripper of a question. Are you guys ready for it? Is there room for punishing your kids and coming down on them? Should there be consequences if they disobey? My answer, 
from a biblical perspective, is yes. But, but, massive but, not without training and instruction. You cannot teach your kids nothing and then punish them. You cannot do that. Because what are you punishing them for? So if you teach them the right thing, and you instruct them in the right thing, and they need to be punished with consequences, that's fair play. Because sometimes our kids need to know that they need to stop. Sometimes our kids need to know that they need to repent. Sometimes our kids need to know that they need to change their behavior. Because what they are doing will lead to death. And it will break their relationships with us and others. They need to understand that. And sometimes our words aren't enough. But they need to understand that in light of the training and instruction you have given them. They cannot be punished or disciplined without an explanation or an understanding. Fam, real talk. I'm that guy that before I discipline my kids, I give them a sermon. I do. Because then they know why. And I do it calm. I don't shout at them. I tell them why I do this and how much I dislike doing this because I love them. But they need to understand. And then I discipline them. And our small, cute, beautiful six-year-old Katie can understand it in such a way that she has replied to me, Dad, just get it over and done with. I understand. I promise. But then she understands. There's no resentment. She knows exactly why the discipline is coming. Why? Bring them up in training and instruction. Last thing, of the Lord. Of the Lord. What is the reason for all of this? Why is this important? Why does Paul write this to the Ephesians? Fam, because we ought to make them disciples. Do you see that? Parents, this is our first and most important discipleship task, is discipling our kids. You can't be hanging around in discipleship groups with other gents and ladies, but you neglect the discipleship of your own children, fam. It's so important. And you are the primary disciple maker, not the school teacher, and not the children's discipleship teacher, and not the pastor, and not the other adults in the city group. They are also there, but they are secondary. Primary is you. So do you know what we tell our kids? If we go through all of this with them, we tell them, kids, what we are doing to you now is expected of us as your parents. God wants this, and therefore we are really serious about this. And then we say to our kids, we are all in this together. I also had to be taught by someone how to live. It was just other people. It was Opa Johan and Oma Elise. And now I'm teaching that to you. And all of us are growing in this together. Dad isn't perfect and mom also isn't perfect. But we need to show you the way. Quick side road here. Gentlemen in the house, I'm speaking to you. Their mom is your wife. And they need to know it. I am meant to protect Marie, to serve her, to help her, to encourage her, to empower her. When the kids exasperate her, Daddy steps in. You have to. And then you have to say to your kids, this is my wife that you are doing this to. And you are hurting her now and I will not have this. Because I am meant to protect her. You will stop now. You will repent or you will face the consequences. That happens in our house. It needs to happen in your house too if you've got a, a mom and a dad. Is that what you want? Oh, earlier I asked you the question, what do you want for your child? Fam, according to the teaching text, here's the answer. It should be that they are brought up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. That's it. There's your answer. It's right there. Is that what you want for your child? Opportunities, a good education, a nice house... Fun, games, sports, blah, blah, blah. It's all secondary. I want to urge you to get your priorities right with your kids. This is what you should want for them. 
that they would be brought up in the training and instruction of the Lord. We've spoken about who should obey who and why. We've spoken about who should honor who and why. We've spoken about who should do what to who and why. Now it's time for us to respond. You've heard the word. We can't not respond. It's either a yes or a no. In this time, Gary Petra and Lesichel, you guys can come up. I want to call on three groups of people today. And when it's time to stand, I am going to ask you to stand so that I can pray for you and that I can pray over you. The first group that I feel called to pray for this morning is I want to pray for parents. <laughs> parents in the house, you know who you are. I really want to pray for you. And I want to pray for your children regardless of their age, regardless of if you still uh, are in a relationship with them, I really feel a burden to pray for parents and for kids. So when the time comes and I ask for everyone to stand, if you're a parent, master of the courage and stand this morning. But there's a second and a third group that I want to pray for too as well. The one is, I want to pray for adults who are still children, but who are really struggling with their parents. I really do. And who are really struggling especially to honor them for whatever reason. I want to pray for you this morning. So if that's you, then stand that I can pray for you. And the third group that I want to pray for is I want to pray for adults in the house this morning who's not parents yet. But who want to commit to being this kind of parent in the future if God wills it. Are you willing to respond and to stand? Let's stand. I'm going to pray for you, and then we are going to sing about God's reckless love. Father God, I pray for my brothers and sisters who are parents and who have children at the moment. I include myself in that prayer. Father God, that you would stir in our hearts a love for our kids that mirror the love that you have for us. That you would help us to not do the don'ts, and that you would help us to do the do's that you would help us in this very important task of bringing up our kids in the training and the instruction of you. Father God, everything you've given us is a gift from your hand. Our marriages to our spouses and the kids that you've given us into our different marriages. They cannot be a burden to us, Father God. And we don't want to steal with them as burden. We want to steal with them as gift. So do whatever you need to do in our hearts this morning, Father God, to, to repent and to turn and, and to start anew and to start afresh. And I really want to pray that if we need to say sorry, that we'll have the courage to say sorry. Not because we can pay back our kids. We never can. But because of the fact that you've paid for it all. Give us the willingness to to humble ourselves to our kids, to be honest about where we missed the mark, and to try again in this way that you teach us. Bless our families, Father God. May we have life and life in abundance in our households. May our people flourish, both moms, dads, and children of all ages. Bless us by a special presence of your Holy Spirit. May our houses be known for the love we have for one another. And then, Father God, I want to pray for our brothers and sisters who still have parents, and who are adults, who's really struggling with their own parents, who has broken relationships, who carries a burden of a relationship that seems that it's beyond reconciliation. Father, fill up their hearts with love for their parents. Fill up their hearts with love that they can channel back to those parents. Not expecting anything back, but just merely letting your love flow through them. And may that be a testimony of your goodness and your grace and your kindness, Father God. To parents who might be stuck in a rut of resentment and in a history of broken relationships. I want to pray that you would heal those that you would do a mighty work in those. And that our brothers and sisters don't have to carry the burden of broken relationships with them.
God, that it will go well with them and that they will have a long life in the land as they honor these parents. Give them a new heart filled with your love today. And I also pray for these parents, wherever they are, that their hearts would be filled with, with love and with compassion for their own children. Make whole what this world is broken, Father God. We know that you are a way maker. And we know that you are a miracle worker. And then I want to pray, Father God, for all of those who might still be present, uh, might be parents in the future, that say yes to this way. May you already start forming inside of them what is needed for them to complete this parental task if you give it to them as gift. Thank you for the word. Thank you that we can respond to it. We know all of this is possible because of the reckless love that you've showed us. And when we sing that now, may that fill up our spirits. May that be true to us. May we not only sing it and hear it, but may we feel it today. And may that make the world, may that make the world's difference to us. We pray that in your name, Lord Jesus, be honored, Father God, as we sing now. Amen.